My name is Lisey Chambers, and I'm president of the League of Women Voters of Ann Arbor County. Our league is sponsoring this legislative candidates forum with the American Association of University Women Ann Arbor County branch as a public service to the residents of District 4. This is our first legislative district forum in several years. While our state senators and delegates may seem more removed from our daily lives than our county executive and council members, they are responsible for passing laws that are directly affect our county as well as the state at large. To help county residents understand the role of our legislature better, we planned forums in four districts, District 30, 31, 32, and 33. Regrettably, last night, the forum that we had planned for District 31 had to be canceled because too few candidates agreed to participate. The League of Women Voters is a national nonpartisan organization whose mission is to empower voters to defend democracy. Candidate forums empower voters to make informed decisions at the polls. They strengthen democracy by bringing constituents and candidates into a common space to exchange views on important issues and concerns. It is discouraging to miss these valuable opportunities. Nonetheless, we are delighted to welcome our two candidates to the State Senate. For tonight's forum, the League invited all candidates that will be on the ballot to represent District 30 in the State Senate and the House of Delegates. Although some did not respond or could not attend, up until four hours ago, five were confirmed. Bob O'Shea and Chelsea Gill notified our forum coordinator this afternoon that they could not attend because they had been called to a mandatory meeting by Delegate Nicholas Kepke. Unfortunately, their absence means that we are unable to include Alice Kane in the formal question and answer portion of the program. Alice Kane is here in the audience and along. Ah, so there she is waving her arm. <laughs> and so in the program, we said we were going to break about 8.45 and have an open, open um, interaction among the audience and the candidates. We're going to do that a little earlier because we only have two people to ask. They're going, to, they're going to get through our questions much faster. So we'll probably break around 8.15, and then I think the candidates are willing to stay and, and meet with you and have you answer your questions directly. <laughs> Lee Candidate Forums follow strict guidelines to ensure that all candidates are treated equitably and to provide voters with candidates' answers on a diverse range of topics. Ground rules for the audience are listed on the back of your program. Three were warrant repeating. Please silence all cell phones. Audience use of cameras and video audiovisual recording equipment is prohibited, and kindly refrain, refrain from applauding or in other ways demonstrating support or non-support for a candidate during the forum. And if you need a question card, just raise your hand. Now that we have the rules down, I'm delighted to introduce Christopher Nelson. Christopher Nelson has been a resident of the area for 27 years. He served as president of St. John's College in Annapolis for 26 of those years, and is now a member of its teaching faculty. Mr. Nelson practiced law in Chicago for 18 years before he and his family moved to Annapolis. He has twice served as a moderator of local and district level candidate forums in prior elections. He has also chaired and served on commissions for county executives and Annapolis mayors of both major parties. Chris is also the son of a lifelong league member and former president of the Ann Arundel County League of Women Voters. I'm guessing that he's been attending candidate forums before he can walk. <laughs> and we appreciate his sharing all of his experience. Please join me in welcoming Christopher Nelson. Thank you. Let me just say a few more preliminaries before we get started. And I know that there's nothing more important than making sure that we have the mics on right. Uh, I tested these with my voice, but it may be that it's a little different for others. Can you hear me clearly in the back? Should we all test Okay, them? well, let us know and wave if there's any difficulty with these other mics as well, or if you want to just say testing to make sure. Testing, can you hear me? Everyone can hear me? It's great. Testing. Yeah, I think with the second microphone, you may need to be a little closer okay. to the mic. Good. Uh, the forum tonight will be, will open with a single question that we'll put to both candidates. The question was prepared by a local uh, League of Women Voters of Anne Arundel County, and it's been shared with the candidates in advance. Each candidate will have two minutes to respond. I'll begin with Ms. Elrith, Elfrith, uh, and moving uh, alphabetically to Mr. George. Uh, if Ms. Elfrith wants to reply to Ms. Mr. George's uh, comments, she'll have 30 seconds, after which Mr. George can follow with another 30 seconds. So we can have a little bit of a conversation. 
since we're down to just our two candidates. Uh, the League has supplied us with timekeepers who will flag the candidates to let them know when their time is drawn to a close. So they'll flag you at uh, 30 seconds and at 15 seconds, and then that big red stop sign will come up and we'll ask you to observe the time limits. Uh, candidates will then entertain questions submitted by the audience. Representatives of the League will gather these uh, written questions on the cards that are being passed out or have been passed out. And uh, these will be screened by people at the front table here for clarity and duplication. Uh, we'll, we'll then bring the questions to me and I will address them directly to the candidates. Candidates will have two minutes to respond to these questions and if replies are called for another 30 seconds. Our goals for the evening are to afford candidates a fair opportunity to respond to the questions and concerns of the audience uh, and to have this accomplished with civility and respect from audience and candidates alike. Uh, so just a quick reminder, it's not a, a forum for political or candidate rallies, and we'll ask that you hold your applause to the end. Uh, as we'll be shortening the length of the forum to about an hour of questions, I'll bring things to a close a little bit after 8 o'clock to give the candidates then two minutes each for closing statements. Uh, followed by an opportunity for you to meet with them informally on the floor. Uh, so let me briefly introduce the candidates, and they'll be able to say something more about themselves as the evening progresses. Uh, Sarah Elfworth, Democratic candidate for the Senate from District 30, has worked as a government affairs director with the National Aquarium and senior director of university projects with Margrave Strategy. She's the president of District 30 Democratic Club. Ron George is a Republican candidate for the Senate from this district. Uh, with his wife, he's the co-owner of Ron George Jewelers in downtown Annapolis. He served in the Maryland House of Delegates from 2007 to 2015. Both candidates have considerably more detail on their websites concerning their backgrounds, positions on issues, and volunteer political activities. <coughs> so, we go to the first question that is on your program. On the second page, but I will nonetheless read it. The Maryland Constitution requires that state legislative districts be compact, contiguous, and give due regard for natural boundaries and political subdivisions. It contains no provisions <coughs> or standards for the drawing of congressional districts. The congressional district maps adopted by the Maryland General Assembly, following a little bit of feedback here. Following the 2010 census, have been repeatedly challenged by state voters. As a member of the General Assembly that will oversee the next congressional redistricting cycle, what specific measures will you enact to address voters' objections and improve the redistricting process in Maryland? Tell me. Good evening. I first want to thank the League for uh, hosting us tonight, thank uh, Mr. Nelson, and thank uh, my uh, distinguished colleague, Ron, for being here. But thank you to the audience. This is what democracy looks like, and with 27 days to go, we appreciate you being here. I'd like to take a note and just reiterate that Alice is here, and I encourage you to get to know her after the fact, and I think Mike Shea, our, our Democratic candidate for delegate District 30B, might be coming a little later as well. I encourage you to know him. To the question. There's uh, no arguing that there is a general sense of discouragement uh, with our political process at the national level. Just a minute, we're, we're correcting the sound. Okay. I want to give you a few more seconds while we make the adjustments. Okay. Try it again. Is this better? Thank you. Uh, there is a, a sense of discouragement at the national level with our political process, and part of that stems from uh, having uh, gerrymandered districts right here in Maryland. It's imperative as leaders of our state that we, uh, when we look towards the 2020 census and the following redistricting, that we employ a nonpartisan commission to take the politics out of redistricting, the redistricting process. But it's also incumbent upon us as leaders of the state to influence our surrounding states to take the same measure. A Potomac compact, perhaps with Virginia or North to Pennsylvania, 
Maryland has led the way in so many ways when it comes to cleaning up the Chesapeake Bay and organizing the original Chesapeake Bay program. We can again be leaders here in influencing our other states, just as we need to be leaders when it comes to stemming the tide of gun violence in our communities, influencing our surrounding states to, to take a leadership role in the trafficking of illegal guns that come into the state. We can be leaders here in Maryland on redistricting, on Chesapeake Bay cleanup, and on stemming the tide of gun violence. Thank you. Mr. Jordan. All right, first of all, I want to thank the League of Women Voters, and I want everyone to know that I've been in other debates with them, and they truly are nonpartisan. They respect the process, and uh, I immediately said yes uh, to this debate. And uh, so I thank them. Uh, a lot of work goes into organizing it, and I wish everyone were here. Um, I will let, let you know this. I received an award from the League of Women Voters in 2013 and 2014. Stop the gerrymander. I led the fight. I had the House bill to create a nonpartisan uh, commission uh, that would oversee it. And then I constructed it in such a way uh, that I did get uh, uh, the uh, Democrats, Republicans on board uh, with it. Uh, but there was no doubt that the Speaker of the House and President of the Senate did not want it to go forward. Um, so then, uh, as the session ended in 2015, I led the fight, or 2014, I led the fight to bring it to the referendum Anne Arundel County had more signatures than any other jurisdiction in the state. I used my two locations of my jewelry store. We had lines going down the street. Democrat, Republican, it was nonpartisan. It's a good government issue uh, to, to please, you know, stop the gerrymandering and to get it on the ballot. Unfortunately, the Secretary of the State was very partisan, and he gets to choose the wording that goes on the ballot. So he took the wording that was from the bill and that said that voting yes will change the way it's d drawn. Well, that's how it was on the bill. The bill passed, so now it already was changed. So if you said yes, then you were for the change. So a lot of people voted yes, feeling that they were saying, yes, I want to change, and they were really voting yes, I support the way it is. It, he really pulled a, a stunt on everyone. So to prove the point, I then led a battle to raise funds to be able to get a poll to show that there was this need and people wanted it. So it surprised the newspapers. People voted one way, and yet the poll was the exact opposite. Um, I'm very much for it. Uh, the, by, by the way, the version of the bill I put forward is the same one Larry Hogan's been working on, and I fully support him in this. And I'm not going to wait for what other states are going to do. Thank you. Sir, is there anything further you'd like to add? I think this is one of the rare moments where we agree on a nonpartisan commission is the best way to move forward. I didn't mean to say that we wait on other states. I meant to say that we exercise the leadership that Maryland has traditionally exercised with our surrounding states and influence them to do the same thing. Thank you. Uh, no, I, I just think we, uh, we do take the lead, so we are saying the same thing in that regard. Um, and, but I've heard the argument of other states aren't doing it, and so I'm not going to be for it, is what so many legislators say. And so I will fight that kind of talk. We need to do this for Maryland. Thank you. Okay, we move to questions from the audience. And the first, which I'll ask Mr. George to respond to first, what would be your priority issues if you were elected to the Senate? And how would you uh, implement your priorities? Uh, two minutes. Okay, uh, well, there's, there's quite a list there. Uh, but one of the most immediate things is to uh, work on the things that Larry Hogan's already put forward that got defeated uh, in the House and in the Senate that are good bills, um, and we want to put them through. I worked on the More Jobs for Maryland Act, and I worked that through the Senate, through the House uh, last year, and we want to continue that and grow that. Uh, it allows us to be able to put uh, improvement zones and businesses into very poor areas in Baltimore City and other places to help bring them back. And uh, somebody said, oh, well, that's, that's corporate uh, welfare, that you're going to give them a big tax break. No, they're willing to take risks to go in there and create these jobs. And it's a risk to them and their employees, and they'll take security and other things. And so I'm for that. I'm for expanding that. I think that's an important one. Um, I hear a lot of things going door to door. Like Sarah, we've knocked on several, several, several thousand doors. Uh, about 18,000 have received our literature, and uh, we haven't stopped. Of course, I started three years ago, so I think you've done very well. Over, over the last couple of years. Um, so uh, finding out the constituent service issues was really important, and there's quite a few of those bills that I'll be putting forward. Uh, one thing that's really important to me is that 
backlog that we have of traffic on the peninsulas. And it's very important to me. That's one thing I'll be working on. There are some solutions, some issues. I want to really have and see the full study on that and the plans for it, especially Mayo Peninsula. I had it, I was the one that came forward and I put a turn lane onto Muddy Creek Road. I got that to be put back in the budget and, uh, and, and, and to get that done. Uh, but apparently they just did temporary one. Now there's a sinkhole. They never did it correctly. And so I really want to push uh, for Mayo uh, Peninsula to get things done. Uh, the opioid crisis is very important to me. I have a degree, a uh, master's degree in uh, clinical psychology, and I'm anxious to help uh, with those issues. I like what Larry Hogan has been doing and putting forward, and uh, he will have my full support. Thank you. Mike Ron, I've knocked on uh, tens of thousands of dollars in this district, and asked voters one simple question. What issues matter most to you and your families? And without a doubt, Resident voters respond that we have some of the best schools in the nation right here in Maryland, but not every child and not every classroom has the resources they need to succeed. Next year, we have a once in a generation opportunity to rewrite our state's education funding formula. And I know that everybody in this room can agree that public education is a public good. Uh, my goals next year when we rewrite that fund funding formula are, are numerous. First, I believe in investing not just more money, but investing money in the right places. Universal free kindergarten. In Shadyside, just a few weeks ago, parents lined up at 6 a.m. to get their child a spot, a coveted spot, in one of the very few pre-kindergarten classrooms, and only uh, one-fourth of those parents were able to get their children in one of those, those classes. I believe in paying our educators what they deserve. We lose so many great teachers to other jurisdictions that pay more money, and we need to invest in keeping our, our talented and experienced teachers right here in Anne Arundel County classrooms. I also, and Ron and I agree on this as well, I also believe strongly in getting uh, more career and technical education into every classroom so that students have a pathway, whether that's college or apprenticeship programs in the military, so that high school is an eternal experience. I'm very proud to be in with the teachers union and plan to be a strong advocate for our public schools next year. Secondly, uh, continuing our progress on the Bay and making sure that regardless of what happens with the Bay program funding in Washington, D.C., that Maryland continues to be a leader when it comes to investing in oyster populations in mitigating that overdevelopment development that causes so much traffic throughout the district by strengthening the Forest Conservation Act at the state level, protecting our critical areas, and finally, investing in renewable energy and tackling climate change head on. I live at the bottom of the city dock in Annapolis, and I've had a, a very hard time getting home the past few weeks because of sea level rise that threatens many parts of this district. So the bay, the environment, jobs, many, many things, very difficult to answer in two minutes, but those are my issues. You're actually going to get a chance to elaborate if you like on that because the next question comes to you first, Ms. Alfred, for two minutes. What efforts are you willing to spearhead to clean up the Chesapeake Bay? Wow, oh, thank you. I was a little ahead of the game there. But I've spent my career working on Chesapeake Bay issues. I served as a head of government affairs for the National Aquarium in Baltimore, which was a very cool job. I got to interact with sea turtles and dolphins, but I also got to work on fisheries issues. I had the opportunity to work on a build a band styrofoam, plastic bags, and bottles that clog our waterways and harm our bay. Uh, we need to do better when it comes to investing in, and I mentioned oyster aquaculture, making it easy to oyster farm. It's a win-win-win. It, it supports small businesses, it cleans the bay, and we all have delicious local oysters to eat. We can do better at protecting those critical areas, strengthening the state laws to make sure that counties are actually doing their job and enforcing critical area laws. Uh, and of course, I mentioned uh, renewable energy. The, the top two fastest growing jobs in the nation, measured by the Bureau of Labor Statistics, a nonpartisan uh, organization, were solar panel manufacturing and wind turbine manufacturing. This is about strengthening our economy while doing right by our planet at the same time. And we have an opportunity next year uh, to continue the path that Maryland has led on investing in renewable energy. Thank you, George. Okay, well, Maggie McIntosh, who headed the Environmental Committee, uh, nicknamed me back in 2008 the, the Green Elephant. <laughs> so that kind of stuck a little bit whenever I've come up with things. Um, in 2010, I put forward the Energy Net Metering Bill uh, to create uh, what it, it allows uh, municipalities, was for municipalities, to put uh, renewable energy credits, credits towards renewable energy. And it would take probably seven or eight years, but they'll save up enough that they can then put up wind turbines or, or solar parks. And so Crisfield, which is the poorest area of the, of the state, on the lower eastern shore, uh, on the bay side, has enough wind. It's one of the few places, three top places, that has enough wind. And they're having a problem with the power and getting uh, energy. 
And I put forward energy net metering and I went to them with the idea and they came and testified for the bill and helped to get it through. And I was part of the celebration a year ago of the opening up of the wind turbines down at, uh, down, down in Crisfield. Uh, nobody else can claim that kind of success on a bill. Uh, there are solar parks that are going up from that too. It's not the only way, but it was a help. And it didn't raise taxes or anything like that. Like many bills, people want to know how are we going to fund it, and all of a sudden there's a big tax increase included. There are answers uh, to do that. Also, my waterways bill in 2008 and my waterways bill, the second edition, which came out in 2012, uh, I lockbox that money. The other waterways fund get, would get robbed all the time. I lockbox this, and it goes to improving the bay, and the bay is the cleanest it's been in many, many years. Um, as you know, um, I also had the idea to put wind energy at Greenbury Point. We came very close to it. My biggest problem is it takes NAPAC in Washington, the Naval Facility Command, and other locations uh, uh, of the Navy to all come together. So I had everyone ready. The Naval Academy has nothing to do with that property. It's an NAPAC facility that's on the north shore uh, of the Severn. And uh, I had them all come together and in favor of it. And then before you know it, after two years, they're all being moved around again. Then I have to start at square one again. Uh, there's a grid in place. I think it's a great, great idea. I'll just stop right there. Thank you. Thank you. Just a quick uh, response. Uh, the Sierra Club, the Maryland League of Conservation Voters, uh, and the Farm Bureau have all endorsed me because they believe in my track record and my vision for making sure we continue progress on the Chesapeake Bay. Um, so the Farm Bureau was a, was a surprise, frankly, because it's a traditionally more conservative group. But when I sat down, we sat down together, we ultimately came to the same conclusion that we're all invested in the same thing, which is a clean, healthy Chesapeake Bay, not just for us, but for generations to come. Uh, it created quite an outrage with uh, the farmers in South County uh, because Sarah was resisting them on all kinds of things that they use, uh, the neonicotinoids and things like that, instead of giving them a slower path to come out of it. Uh, finally, the bill was changed to just labeling, which was good. Um, so they're all very upset about that. The speaker and Sarah were both selected, and uh, it's, it's, it was kind of an odd arrangement, and um, they are suspecting there was something else going on there. But, uh, yeah, I, we, we just don't know. We have people from the board. They believe that Stuart Pittman, who was on the board, had a lot to do with it also. Uh, so that whole thing, just it's, it's a wash. Uh, so I'm, I'm just going to leave it there. But uh, when you go to the farmers, they all can't believe it. They're all very upset about it with their own bureau. Thank you. So, uh, Mr. George, for two minutes, yes. how should the state ensure the medical How should the state ensure good medical health care for all Americans? Well, I would disagree uh, with, with the people that are saying single payer. Uh, I've been studying that in other states and, and you know, other places that they have tried it in other countries. Uh, I know we're different here, uh, but uh, I think it would, would knock us out. We would be losing our good physicians. Um, one other thing uh, that's really important for good health care is to keep your physicians. Johns Hopkins hasn't had a graduate stay in Maryland for many years. Uh, the fact is, is Maryland is one of the poorest areas for doctors to get reimbursed. So I formed the Doctors Caucus when I was in there, and then I had doc uh, legislators who wanted to help doctors. I formed the Physicians Advisory. Physicians could come testify, and we got the reimbursement rate up some, and wouldn't you know it, insurance companies have brought it back down. The problem we have in Maryland is that anything with health care, if it deals with ins insurance companies, it goes to health and government operations, and all of them get big no donations from the insurance companies. And then if it deals with uh, uh, legislative things, it goes to the uh, Judiciary Committees, and uh, they have a lot of lawyers on their committees. So it's like a, a, a doctor can't win. We have to do something different. We're going to have a severe, severe health care crisis if we don't start getting doctors in here. My brother is Dr. Stephen George. He's, he's a uh, very recognized, world recognized. Uh, rheumatologist, uh, and he's had a lot to do uh, with, with many studies, and uh, he's reached uh, retirement age and is sticking around because there's no one really to take his place, the kind of thing he does. He's willing to train, he's willing to work with people, uh, but people don't want to stay in Maryland. So uh, that's one area uh, for physicians to do, uh, to work there. I also want to, I, I do not agree with what the state did in 2011. They put a bill in, and they put it in the, in the BRFA bill, uh, to take away health care benefits of retirees of the state, state retirees. And I, I voted against it. Um, 
Sarah's party, everyone voted for it. I can think they were told to do that. I thought it was dishonest. I, I just, just to finish up, the fact of the matter is, is that they didn't even tell the retirees. So this year came when it was supposed to happen. They made it right. It wouldn't happen until this year. And it just happened. They were all surprised with it. And they want to get to the bottom of it. Well, I voted against that bill. Thank you. Maryland has always been a leader on affordable and accessible health care. We had many of the protections of the Affordable Care Act before the Congress made, uh, made that law a reality nationally. Here in Maryland, we have the all-payer system. It's unique of the, to the 50 states, and it, it's a wonderful system in which all ratepayers, private insurers, Medicare and Medicaid, uh, pay the same to hospitals. So that does a number of things. It keeps costs down for all of us, taxpayers, hospitals, insurers. It also ensures that hospitals have a greater stake in making sure that you get and stay healthy. That's resulted in a number of uh, wonderful things in our community. Right here, Anne Arundel Medical Center opened up a clinic right on Forest Drive that serves 6,000 patients a year. You probably drive by it every day, didn't know it existed. It serves mostly underinsured and uninsured people. And it keeps them healthy, it serves as a primary care uh, place of medicine and it keeps them out of emergency departments that are costly for everybody involved. We need to continue those innovations here in Maryland, uh, make sure that we protect that federal waiver with this federal administration, but we can also do more. We can do more to make it easier for seniors to age in place. We can do more to keep cost of prescription drugs down for all Marylanders. When people are choosing between eating and buying insulin, we have a real problem as a society. And as uh, leaders of our state, it's incumbent upon us to find solutions to those problems. On Ron's uh, uh, piece on the pension system, I was not in the legislature when that happened. I will not take the bullet for people who voted uh, for that, but I can tell you it's gonna be top priority this legislative session to find a solution for so many pensioners who have relied on the state system. Um, we're send, asking you to send us to Annapolis to find that solution, and I promise you that we will. Thank you. Yes, if I may. Um, yes, the all-payer system, you know, I was getting to that and I don't realize, I, feels like time's going faster when I'm talking, and I know it's not. It's just when you're up here, that's what it seems like. Um, the all-payer system is very important, and the fact that we got a stronger extension on that and how that works and, and, and firm that up is huge for Maryland. Uh, it's very good, and I thank Sarah for bringing that up. Um, so that's where, that's where we are. I mean, we're one of the better systems, but how do we get health care for all? She mentioned the clinic out on Forest Drive. Uh, Dr. Friedman is, was a good member of our doctor's caucus, a very strong member, and I helped him on many issues to get the first clinics open when he was trying to do that sort of thing. Thank you. Ms. Albert, anything further? Yeah. Then I uh, just wanted to start with Ms. Albert for two minutes. To what extent should the state support private school education? I am a proud product of public schools, so is my whole family. I had the good fortune of earning a scholarship to Towson University, and I believe that public education is the best investment we can make as a government and as a society. Uh, there have been a number of measures over the last few years to use public tax dollars to pay for private and religious education. I, I disagree with that. I think we need to work very hard to better the schools that we have that are the public good in our communities, and we have that opportunity next year when we rewrite the state's education funding formula, again, to invest in universal pre-kindergarten, to pay teachers what they deserve, to get more support staff that are sorely needed in our schools, everything from social workers to counselors to psychologists. There are schools in this county that have 800 students to one counselor. Now, that's not doing everybody, anybody a service. Frankly, it's a threat to the public safety of our schools, and we need to use all of our public dollars for public schools. Well, I also know that uh, many types of education work for many types of people, and everyone's paying taxes, so it's not really taking money. Sometimes when you talk about giving a little bit of a break uh, to, the, the, to the, some of the private schools, and Saint, I'm talking about like St. John's College. Now, uh, we have a person here as president of the college for many, many years, and the Selinger grants are really important to help keep them going, uh, and many people go there. They want to keep the tuitions as low as possible. It's not necessarily taking money away from the public school system to do that. And that's what people are thinking that it does. Uh, the Selinger grants are in their own category and are treated quite differently. Um, so I do support it uh, to an extent. You certainly don't want to go over the top, but I would hate to see many of these private schools uh, disappear. And uh, I think that's important. 
Uh, our public education is important. We know that uh, there's going to be asking for big increases again, and uh, Sarah's mentioned this a couple times. One thing we have in Maryland is we have the highest administrative positions in the country. Um, of the top 10, four of them are Maryland jurisdictions. And it's true in the top 20, there's, there's uh, more than that, I think it's like almost eight of them, ten of them, nine, eight to 10 of them. Uh, the problem is, is we have so many administrative positions, so much money going there. I'd like to see that money go more directly to the classrooms and stop growing all of these positions that aren't dealing with the classroom. The teachers need that money. We raised the money that was supposed to go to the classrooms and it seems to be going someplace else. So that's the main, main thing for me is to make sure money goes more directly to the classrooms. Um, I was part of it when we increased the, the funding last time. I saw it go up and I saw problems in the classroom. Also, the, the schools that we're building are becoming such expensive Taj Mahals. We're overspending on the construction of the schools. Uh, you can look at Smyrna Park High School. I walked to help them get it to, to get a school there because they were on the list a long time. Seemed to get dropped down, so I ended up throwing support behind it, but I was surprised at the amount they decided would go there and the type of uh, building that it is. You can build good schools without making it a Taj Mahal marble. You know, you don't, you, you can build a good school without doing that. Thank you. 30 seconds for yourself. To clarify, I was referring to uh, public money going to K-12 private schools. When it comes to the Selinger formula, it is one of the more uh, elegant in its beauty ways that we fund our higher education system. I had the opportunity to be appointed by the governor to serve as the student member of the University System of Maryland Board of Regents working on uh, setting tuition policy, hiring and firing university leadership. The way that we fund higher education in the state is beautiful. We have one set amount for our uh, comprehensive four-year universities and research universities. That is directly tied to the amount of funding that we give to our great private universities and directly tied to our community colleges. And I think that is a tremendous formula and has led to the fact that we have one of the best higher education systems in the country. Thank you. Mr. George, uh, Yeah, so just let's not, when we talk about uh, school going, money going to private schools, we are talking about Selinger and everything all the way down because Selinger grants are suddenly cut some years during their Mali years, unexpectedly, last minute, and the schools weren't able to prepare. Uh, so we have to make sure that we also protect the, that money also. Thank you. Okay, so this question now goes first to Mr. George. Yes, two minutes. What initiatives would you pursue to address overdevelopment, traffic, road, bridge construction? Overdevelopment, traffic? Overdevelopment, traffic, and road and bridge construction. Well, I, you know, I, listen, I was in the legislature when all of a sudden, you know, we had a recession come. And we're supposed to be getting money, and Obama sent money over to be used on roads and bridges, and it wasn't. It was used elsewhere. And I looked at the money that was supposed to be going to roads and bridges all during those eight years. Nobody knew where it was going. Roads were not improving. What a difference it is with Larry Hogan in there. It's not because we're making a little more money. The money that was supposed to go there, he lockboxed it. He's trying to make sure that that money always goes to the road improvement and bridge in, uh, improvement. And I think we're getting there. I think we are. Um, I do see certain parts of the state. I see some parts of South County, uh, some, some things in the Annapolis area that we need to get onto the list. I will work hard for that. I served on the Transportation Subcommittee. Um, I worked on the plans for expanding the Severn River Bridge early on. We never got the last administration to go through with it. Thankful uh, this governor did. Um, and, uh, you know, we, we wanted to take care of, like, as I said before, the traffic in the peninsulas. There are some ideas out there, folks, and we need to get them out there and talk about them, get them on the table. Because, uh, you know, I said this, you know, uh, six years ago, I was saying, you know, we need to be proactive on, on roads and bridges, and we're not. We were behind during the O'Malley years. So we're still catching up. You're seeing a lot of improvement going on, but there's a lot of money being put towards from the Transportation Trust Fund now that's lockboxed in and being put to the roads. Uh, so we're going to get there. I will fight for it for this area. I, I don't like the fact of what's happened. I mentioned Mayo before and their traffic problems. Uh, if there's a medical issue and it's a certain time of day, you can't get out of there. Um, so I was part of getting the uh, emergency uh, people down there. We have a, a center uh, where people could be treated immediately. And we also have a, a helicopter uh, that will be coming uh, that I worked on and we spoke about years ago uh, that can help transport people when needed out of that area. Um, is that it? I, I have two seconds. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> uh, District 30 is quite a diverse uh, place. We go all the way from the Broadneck Peninsula to Heritage Harbor, all the way down to Friendship. 
But there seems to be one unifying theme, which is that we are growing faster than many residents are comfortable with. And we're seeing that in overcrowded schools, we're seeing that in, in congestion on our roads, uh, longer commute times. We're also seeing that as a strain on our public safety officials when we have some of the longest response times in South County, and frankly, that's unacceptable. At the state level, we can do a number of things to mitigate that overdevelopment. Chief among them, strengthen the state's Forest Conservation Act. That was first passed in uh, 1991 or 92, I believe, um, and has not been strengthened since. Now that sets the bar for the type of forest that we can take down and the measure at which we replace that forest. Uh, I believe that we should have a one-to-one -one, uh, system, just like the city of Annapolis just passed, that we protect contiguous and uh, forests, forests that are closest to watersheds, to make sure that we provide the natural filtration system for the bay that was here before we were. We can also, again, strengthen our critical area laws to cut back on some of that overdevelopment and mitigate so much of the congestion we're seeing in our roads, our classrooms, and for our public safety officials. This question then will go to Ms. Delta first. Uh, two minutes. How will you address making Maryland you know, business friendly and help make Maryland business economically competitive? It's a wonderful question. I spent uh, some time working at the University of Maryland on what's called the Greater College Park Project. Uh, we, our job was to make it a, a better university town for faculty and staff to live and walk closer to campus, to build startup spaces for so many of our wonderful companies that are uh, growing, starting and growing on university campuses and provide them space so when students graduate they can keep those companies here in Maryland, that tax base, that job creation, that innovation, and not in Silicon Valley. We can do a lot more of that type of work. We have some of the best higher education systems, uh, institutions, including the Naval Academy, we have NIH. We have all the tools in our toolkit right now. We just need to make sure that we are keeping that talent here in Maryland and we're making it as easy as possible for businesses to open and for good paying jobs to prosper here. Thank you. Uh, you said make Maryland more business friendly and competitive. And competitive. Well, thank you. As a business owner, and I've had my business on Main Street Annapolis since 1991. I've worked in businesses in the area since 81, uh, doing work for different stores. So I had a business at home before I went to the retail store. Um, I suffered uh, through a lot of uh, things going on, uh, Glendanning years and during the Romali years, and we started to see some fresh air. Um, I would really like Larry Hogan to really go full throttle on uh, small businesses. I'm all about these small businesses and helping them grow. Uh, it's very difficult when you are very responsible for all your employees and all the health care. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm one person, I'm probably the only one running that signs the front of a paycheck, you know, uh, each week. Uh, it's, it's really important, I think, that people understand business. Uh, the mayor of Annapolis didn't quite understand it when he wanted to put the, the bike lane in in an area that was just made it too thin, the emergency vehicles couldn't go up, and he just wouldn't listen to us. He said, he said well, Ron George just wants to park in front of the store. You know? uh, there's a disconnect there. Um, you might have good ideas, but you really need to vet them and work them out. I'm not against bikes. We can have bike lanes all around town. There are ways to do it. We even offered some ideas to them. Uh, but the Main Street, upper part of Main Street, is not the way. And taking out all those meters without understanding the effect it had on the businesses is tough. Um, so you need someone in there who understands business and how it's supposed to work. Um, I was in there, like I said, during the Mali years, it seemed every time there was uh, another shortfall, raise taxes. You know, if there was uh, businesses aren't making enough revenue, raise taxes. It was always raise taxes. Uh, Larry Hogan gets it. He and I are both small businessmen. One thing that a lot of small business owners, when they go into the legislature, they seem to get it. They become very solution-oriented. I am solution-oriented, and I work very hard. If there's a problem, there's an answer. That's Larry's philosophy. That's how he works. That's how I work. And I'm looking forward to working with him to create jobs. It isn't enough to say you're going to create jobs uh, because you're for the environment or you're going to create jobs. That does not answer it. Uh, you have to really understand how the economy works. Uh, I've taught on it. I, I've lived it. And uh, I would certainly have an answer. I apologize. I wonder if you could each uh, give us maybe 30 seconds on a follow-up question. Okay. which is um, your views on raising the Maryland minimum wage for self Great. Uh, I, I mentioned I was raised by, I haven't actually mentioned, I was raised by a single mother, I was going to save that towards the end, who was able to uh, raise my sister and, and me because she had affordable access to child care and she had a good union job, she was a probation officer, they made sure that she had affordable health care, 
and a living wage that we had a place to live. Um, I see so many people in our county struggling. Uh, it's one of the more expensive counties to live. A minimum wage does not even pay for a, a, an apartment here in Anne Arundel County. We're seeing as so many of our teachers, our police, our firefighters live not just in other counties, but in Pennsylvania because it's, it's so expensive to live here in Anne Arundel County. I believe those people make the best neighbors and we need to do more to make sure that we support um, a living wage, but we do it in a way that's responsible for business. I know that businesses respect uh, continuity and predictability, so I believe that we need to phase it in and give them the opportunity to adjust. Uh, Mr. Jerk, your views on raising? Yeah, no, I, I don't support it because as an employer, I do raise it as my employees come in. I've never started someone at minimum wage. I always start with them a little higher, but now that's considered minimum wage. And I still don't know what they can do or how effective they are. Usually after a couple months, I get it, I know what they want, and then I set their salary. Um, to have them come in at $15 an hour on just a part-time job where you give people little odd jobs to do, it was a good way of training the young people, kids from high school and things of that sort. We don't even hire them anymore. You don't, and, and they're not learning that type of work ethic. And so many people learn that way. Is, am I already up? That was a quick, see, was that 15 seconds? So no, I don't support it, because anytime you try to do something, it's going to have ramifications someplace else. You don't artificially do something. That's not how the economy works. OK, so uh, Mr. George, uh, what, tell us what controls you would uh, support for guns. Well, I think that the laws that they have, the red flag law, uh, needs to be uh, looked at, uh, see if there's ways to strengthen that. Um, the idea of, now, now you said controls for guns. I think uh, the problem we're having with the shootings has more to do with mental health issue, and I've spoken on that before. Um, we now have enough indicators all the way down from all the different mass shooters that are similar whether they were rejected, these men that were rejected by a woman, and that shouldn't be enough to make you shoot. But when you, when you get all of these indicators together, you see that there are similarities in mental health issues. And I think that's where we should start, because once we have these indicators, and that's my bill, to put a commission together to help us with these things. I have psychologists from Johns Hopkins willing to be on the commission, people to take part, that'll help us study all these other shooters and see what's similar. Ramos had so many of the similarities, you know, uh, stalking a woman and things like that. Well, he shouldn't have a gun. Third time that he got a, uh, you know, he, he was a restraining order for three times and he still could go buy a gun. That was wrong. I think that uh, it's so important for us to look at all of these things and then make sure we're getting the hands, the guns out of the hands of those that are mentally ill uh, in certain ways. The indicators are there and that's exactly where I would start. I have that degree in clinical psychology. I'm able to bring uh, the, the psychology uh, people together and uh, you know we'll have other people on the commission you know human rights and all of that uh, to protect your rights uh, but we really have to start on this we can't put it off anymore this idea that somehow uh, we might be uh, hurting someone's uh, private right uh, to have a gun starts getting a little muddy when you know that uh, the right of the woman who's being stalked needs to be protected too. And that's why it's so, so important to really put this together and then put something together uh, that uh, can work in Maryland and be passed and show other states uh, how we would do it. So that's the first ones that we want to remove the guns from and uh, it is a mental health issue. Thank you. Gun violence is our national tragedy and it's our national shame. Here in Maryland, we have some wonderful gun laws, some of the strongest in the nation, but we need to do more. I have never been more proud to receive an F than I was yesterday when the NRA gave me an F based on my questionnaire and uh, my positions on strengthening our already strong gun laws. Uh, I agree with Mr. George that uh, the tragedy at the Capitol stemmed from, frankly, violence against women and the fact that we need to take that much more seriously in the state that we need to remove the guns from people who are convicted of harassment and stalking. The red flag law was a good step in that direction, but there's more to do. I'm not running for office just to send thoughts and prayers every few weeks that this occurs at a national level, but that we continue to look in the mirror, ask ourselves all our questions, and find solutions together as a community. We have some of the best uh, minds here in Maryland, from Johns Hopkins to NIH to the University of Maryland. We need to put those together, treat 
gun violence, like the public health crisis that it is, find the, 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 where the, it starts so we can identify how to solve it. We need universal background checks, something that 90% of Americans agree on, but we don't have here in Maryland. We can accomplish that next year. We need to keep hand, guns out of the hands of minors. The fact that you, if you're an adult and you have children in the house under the age of 16, you have to keep your gun locked up, but once they turn 17, uh, you don't have to anymore. We need to strengthen those laws. We need to make sure that we, as I mentioned in the beginning, are a leader when it comes to uh, influencing other states. When the majority of guns that are used in violence in Baltimore City and right here in Annapolis are illegally trafficked guns coming from other states with weaker gun laws, we can't wait for Congress to act when we know it won't. We need to be a leader, work together with our surrounding states to strengthen our regional gun laws. Thank you. Just, just, just a brief one. Um, in 2013, I had a mental health bill that I put in, and we had psychologists and everyone lining up for it, and it was getting a lot of attention. Sadly, O'Malley felt it was interfering with his gun law bill, and so he kind of shut it down, and it didn't really get the hearing it should have. Um, so I'm looking forward to getting in there. That, that's number one, uh, as soon as I get in. Uh, we've already been working on the drafting of the bill, taken from my 2013 uh, bill, and expanding on it with what else we have and we know. So, thank you. Mental health is a very serious issue that plagues our communities. We need to make sure that it's fully funded and that people have reasonable, affordable access to mental health services they need. But that is not the, the solution alone. It's not, uh, for lack of a better term, the silver bullet when it comes to stemming gun violence. And we need to have two tracks. We need to take it seriously. And frankly, um, I wasn't in the legislature, but uh, my opponent voted against a number of common sense gun laws that most Marylanders agree with. Everything from requiring licensing of handguns to, to banning assault weapons uh, here in Maryland. Can I respond since I got, got shot at at that time? No. I'll do it later. Okay. Yeah, let's do that. Take a proposal because we've got to, we're not yeah. going to have enough time for all the questions that come in. Okay. Uh, but this one then uh, goes to Ms. Elbert first. How would you strengthen police and civilian relations in the state? That's a great question. I spend a lot of uh, my free time at, at a group called Eastport Working Together. It's a group that came together after a, a number of violent incidents plagued our communities in Eastport. It's a group that brings together uh, folks from all sides of Eastport, but most importantly focuses on the children who live in public housing in Eastport. And we ask the question, what do you need? What's going to prevent you from getting involved in, in violence? Or how can we help you as a community? And their answer was simple. We need mentors. We need jobs. We need people who care about us. We need a better school system. Um, we can strengthen police community relations. And by the way, the police are there. Annapolis PD has been a wonderful partner with that group. They're there. They often actually cook the food for our dinners and are part of that conversation. And it's groups like that uh, that are really making the difference in our communities. It is a very micro solution to a macro problem, but that's where the issues start, and that's where we need to find solutions. Well, I've done a lot of volunteer work, and I've worked in the inner cities, and I've worked with runaways and pushouts and people that were in gangs, and they needed to be gotten out of gangs. Um, when I was in New York City, I helped uh, get women uh, who had uh, young women who had run away from home, and they got pushed into drugs and then prostitution in New York City to get them off the street, to get them back home. We had done a, quite a few things like that. Um, and I have to tell you, the young people, when they really sit, you sit down with them and you really talk to them, and, and what are you going to do with your life? You know, you're always going to be mad at how your parents were, or, you know, we talk things out. And in the counseling process, you come to find out that they have a real hunger to just go to work. They're not against it. Uh, but everything's being handed to them. And I think uh, one thing we have to do, even with our inner city kids, is allow them to have chores and to be able to be paid for it. A young man was wandering around downtown, had nothing to do, and he asked me for some money. And I said, all right, you wash my windows and I'll give you eight dollars. And I said, you come back next week, I'll do the same. And he was all excited and he kept doing it. And then he did more. And I said, okay, use me as a reference, go ask some other stores. And before you know it, he was doing all this work and he was saving it all up and he was doing great. He was feeling good about himself. He was putting some money aside. He was looking forward to surprising his grandmother with a Christmas gift. And uh, then one day he stopped showing up. Apparently he got beat up and money taken from him. And he was, you know, it's, so I think getting the relationship within, not just with the police, but all of us, get involved, volunteer. People are afraid to go into these communities and so many of these young people are looking for answers and they need someone to tell them. 
uh, this Adopt a Big Brother program and things like that. We have to get that going again in the area. And uh, the kids are being drawn in because there's no other way for them to, to, to go is what I'm saying. And uh, the respect for the police will be there. The police for the kids is there. Annapolis is doing a tremendous job. I've been in those places where they have done things and worked with the kids. And it's great to see. But I think we need more adults doing that. And uh, so, so seriously think about that. Thank you. Are there any legislative or other initiatives that you would pursue to bring the two parties together? Mr. George. Well, um, I have the endorsement of the former Democratic Speaker of the House, Clayton Mitchell. And in his comments, he said that Ron George had the ability to bring people together from both parties to get things done. And you will see, bill after bill after bill, I made sure it was nonpartisan. I don't treat anyone as my enemy in there. They can, I don't like it when anyone in a party does that. Um, I was asked to chair the Anne Arundel County delegation, which was half Democrat, half Republican. I was voted overwhelmingly to do that because I was able to pull people together to get things done. We had no infighting. I said, I'm not going to hear it if somebody wants to put somebody down. The main purpose of anyone in a leadership position is to keep decorum, make sure the process is respected. We seem to have lost that in the House. And Clayton Mitchell, when he was there, he respected everybody. And he let everybody vote their own conscience. He didn't demand that they vote with the party. And we have too much of that, where people have to vote just with the party. Let people go. Let, it, let them talk to each other. We work out ideas. I'd have people on a bill, and then they were told they needed to be taken off the bill, because they were told to. And it's not right. And uh, so I just really think that uh, some people have been in leadership too long uh, in the State House, and it's messing up our system. Uh, but I did build bipartisan coalitions, and I have a long list of, of things that I accomplished, even the mental health bill that I told you about. More than half were Democrats on that bill. I don't go looking for people just for my party. I sit down and explain the issue and I try to build coalitions. And that way I had a good relationship with everybody. Not many Republicans got a lot of things passed. I passed a lot of good ideas and a lot of good bills. Thank you. So I have not served in elected office before, but I did have the, the pleasure of working with the General Assembly for the last 10 years of my career, working across the aisle on bipartisan issues like the environment, like education. And Look forward to continuing that uh, next year. Senator John Astle, who's held the seat for, for the last two decades and, and who's supporting me for, for this election, is a fan of saying that politics stops after Election Day and partisanship stops after Election Day. There is no Republican or Democratic solution. There's just the right solution for our, our community. Um, on a specific issue that I'd like to work on, I, I knocked on a door last week of a gentleman named Elliot who uh, volunteered that hunger in our community is such a huge issue for particularly children. So many of our children go to school hungry on an empty stomach and find it very difficult to learn. To me that's a nonpartisan issue that we can continue working on when it comes to um, making sure that the, the schools that need it have all the funding that they need to provide um, not just uh, free and reduced meals at lunchtime but also breakfast. Um, there are a number of nonprofit organizations like Backpack Buddies that are sending much needed food home on weekends for children. The fact that we live in a community that has uh, such a high percentage, I believe it's 13% of, of children, of young people, who uh, leave, live in food insecure households, that's certainly a nonpartisan issue that I would like to tackle next year. Okay, we're coming to about five minutes from now. I'm going to ask you to uh, give us some closing statements. So, I've got a number of questions that haven't been asked, and I'm going to ask you if you would take 15 to 30 seconds on each of these and you'll see if we can't get through okay. uh, a few. Okay. If, uh, oh if that's entirely right. unreasonable, just say so. Okay. And uh, I can make an allowance for you. Uh, but then I'll make the allowance for both. What's your time on this? Let's put 30 seconds from you. But if you can keep it shorter, do so, but we'll have a little more time. So uh, what steps would you take to improve public Transit. Uh, for too long, government has treated uh, transportation as a, a city or a county issue when it's really about our region. I commuted to Baltimore and commuted to D.C. and lost countless hours in car and traffic because there are not enough good public transportation solutions that connect people from where they live to where they work to where they learn. We can do a much better job thinking about it uh, regionally instead of uh, on a very myopic uh, jurisdictional basis. And uh, I commend Governor Hogan for staying true to the Transportation Trust Fund and investing in roads, but we also need to make sure that public transportation is a priority uh, as we move forward in our economy. It's an economic priority. 
One thing I've seen with public education is that it's in the wrong hands. You need a business person who really understands how to work it. The problem is, is that um, Annapolis, for instance, would have a bus and it would run a route, but it couldn't afford another bus. So the route would get so wide and so long, it would take you a long time to get where you were going, and pretty soon the ridership would sink down. And so I think by having smaller buses uh, for, for within town, you know, the, the minivans and things like this that just go back and forth in certain areas really are important. You can really get people around much better. I have some that do nothing but go from the parking garage up at the Circle, Taylor Circle to Annapolis and back, and shorter distances is, would, would really help. Same question for both of you. This time it is, how would you go about funding these measures you've talked about? Uh, let's say that we lose to George first. All right. Um, you know, if, if, if you park at, a, uh, at the park place it's, and, and you work downtown, it's only $2 an hour. Um, you know, you could increase that an extra buck. That would help people riding the bus. We give a, give a little bit towards it. It has to be self-funding in a way, but the big buses are so expensive. And so many of these ones, I think if they were smaller, they would work. But I think you could privatize them too. People would love to make extra money, privatize them, and charge a low, low, low price and make it work. And I think you can do that. You can keep it. You can set the prices what it should be and let people do that, make some extra money. I can be quick, using transportation money for transportation. Uh, again, um, making sure we're improving our roads, but also using that money for public transportation. The needs that, uh, particularly in South County, that didn't have any public transportation below Edgewater, and a group of wonderful community activists got together and started a bus similar to what Mr. George is talking about to directly connect people with where they work and learn and live. We can do more of that. Ms. Alfred, do you support a second Bay Bridge on Route 50 in yeah. Annapolis? I do, um, but as a hopeful member of the General Assembly, uh, we need to also find a way to pay for that, and the cost of a new Bay Bridge is going to be quite significant. Uh, but I do, if we can find a, a responsible, reasonable way and locations to pay for it. Mr. George? Uh, yeah, I mean, I was part of that transportation uh, committee while we worked in this, and we came up with a few different locations. One of it was closer to Baltimore, up near the top, uh, and, and it would go across, and that would alleviate some, because so many of those cars are coming down this side trying to come across instead of going around uh, the shore side. Uh, there are different ways to work it, um, but I think part of the problem is, like I said, the Transportation Trust Fund was rated for so many years, uh, and we didn't know where the money that was meant for transportation was going. And uh, I think that we would also get help uh, from the federal government on that, because that is part of an interstate road. And uh, so we can work it all together. I think we need to start working on it. Thank you. Okay. Uh, for Mr. George, yes. uh, 30 seconds again. Many se seniors contemplate leaving Maryland because of high tax rates and uh, the state's inheritance tax. What would you do to encourage seniors to stay in Maryland? Let's take this for a minute. Okay. Um, the uh, state tax, now, now you're talking about, you weren't talking about estate tax, you were talking about? Tax rates and inheritance tax. Inheritance tax, and there's two different, there's two, two different two things, different things on that. Um, I led the, the repealing of the estate tax. Uh, the inheritance tax is something quite different, a different model, um, and uh, we certainly helped in that regard. Um, but. I think that, uh, that I've said it's my number one thing, the number one tax cut I want to work towards is uh, on retirees. Uh, it needs to go down. Uh, so many retirees, um, the taxes have kept going up, but their income wasn't going up uh, for so long, and they're hurting uh, very much. And I think that's really the next area that we should look at is to help our retirees and keep them here, local in Maryland. Um, I also worked on a few other things uh, to help retirees, and I'd be happy to talk on those at some point. But I, I think that's. Uh, that's the most important thing, is to cut that tax for them um, and, and keep them here in Maryland because they give back in so many ways and it's, it's important to keep them here and it's splitting up families when you have people who work here with young families and they have a good job and mom and dad have to move away, the grand and granddad have to move away. So, this is a, a question I thought about in advance uh, because I often think of my parents. They recently retired and moved to Fenwick Island, Delaware. I have a beautiful home, they're near the beach, but at the same time, they often complain to me that they have to drive three hours for their doctor, that they have uh, terrible roads that are wreaking havoc on their cars, that they have something like 12 police officers to serve the entire county. And when they complain to me, I say, well, you kind of get what you pay for. 
Here in Maryland, we have some wonderful public schools. We have improvements to make on roads, but they're pretty decent. We are a leader in, in healthcare and protecting the Chesapeake Bay. I agree with Ron that we can make it easier for people to retire here, but we also can't make it a race to the bottom in competition with other states. We can take a leadership role, and again, I agree with Governor Hogan when he led the effort to ease the burden on uh, uh, taxing uh, pensions for both uh, military uh, retirees, veterans, but also our public safety personnel, firefighters, police. I'd like to continue to uh, make that easier for uh, those retirees and other retirees to, to stay, live, and thrive in Maryland. We don't okay. get involved in today. Um, well, let me ask you to take a breath and put your, your thoughts on uh, closing statements. Uh, and I'll just make a general apology. You know, these two have been going for an hour, and, and there were to be another six or seven candidates at one point or another. And we're going to give them a little break and an opportunity for you to meet with them and talk with them informally, uh, just following the closing statements. We're all, we're both so aware of the time. Have you noticed how we're talking faster and faster? It's, it's we apologize. So we uh, opened with uh, the first question, started with Ms. Elpeth, so we'll have the closing statement, Mr. George first, and then Ms. Elpeth. Two minutes. Listen, I grew up here. I'm, I'm now looking to represent entirely where I grew up. Um, I grew up in Howard County, uh, but I spent my summers here in the southern part of the county and also Annapolis itself. I fell in love with the area. Happened to be up in New York City for a little bit, and I met a beautiful ballerina, my wife Becky, uh, 37 years now, and uh, I said, you're gonna love it, we're, we're going to Annapolis. And I came here, this is where I wanted to settle. It's a beautiful area, raising my children here. Uh, we, we've enjoyed it very much. Uh, we have six grandkids, and they live far away, but they can't wait to come home to Annapolis. Uh, it's a beautiful area, it's in my heart, it's in my soul. And when I served in the state legislature, I want to recognize Debbie Yatsik, who's here. She was my aide for eight years uh, in the state house, and we were number one on constituent service. Uh, so anybody had a problem, uh, we, we were right on it. And, you know, we're going to carry that on. I'm, that's going to be uh, very important in my office. Um, people had problems. It could be with a different department in the state, and they weren't getting the answer they needed. Uh, retirees, whatever the situation was, uh, we were going on that all the time. I had hearings to things, bills to work on, but always had the time for them. I'm accessible. Um, Maryland Inn, I have to tell you a secret, they have a great place to have a breakfast. It could be a $4 bowl of oatmeal with cinnamon and apple. It could be like uh, Chesapeake, you know, whatever it's called, you know, and have crab meat and everything all over the edge. But there's nobody ever there in the morning. So I meet with constituents there. I meet with them in the coffee house, but also my store. People are welcome any time to come in and talk to me, and they do, and they do. Um, also, my office would be in the state house, but that can be kind of tough to get in. So if somebody calls there and they want to meet with me, I will go meet with them. And uh, constituent service is number one. Um, my love for this area is number one, and uh, it's in my heart. And just like that in my volunteer work in New York, I take it the same way here. Uh, I, I love helping people. I love solving the problems. And I look forward to doing it again. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Ron and I agree and, uh, are, and share very similar campaign strategies. We've knocked on tens of thousands of doors over the course of this election. And when I ask people what issues matter most to them, it's, it's the Bay and continuing progress there. It's strengthening our public schools. It's an economy that works for everybody. But it's also, I hear, a general frustration with uh, what's going on in D.C. And that's less of a, a statement on one person or one party. I think it's a general sense of frustration over a feeling of not being represented, of people not listening to one another, of people not working for the people that they serve. I can tell you that the type of senator I want to be is the type of candidate I've been, knocking on tens of thousands of doors, being accessible. Uh, constituent services will be a priority for my office as well. I would love to hold town halls monthly rotated around the district to continue these conversations. I'm not running for office. Uh, for any other reason than to provide the same opportunities for Marylanders that my family had. Affordable childcare, quality public schools, access to a clean environment, uh, protections when it comes to uh, affordable health care. I had the opportunity to, to come down to Maryland on a scholarship and the first thing I did when I got my first paycheck after graduate school was to turn around and fund a endow a scholarship so that other young women could get their foot in the door in politics and policy. I'm, I'm running for office because I want to provide the same opportunities that, that I and my family had. Um, 
I ask for your vote because I think this is the last time we get to speak uh, on November 6th. Uh, we have 27 days left. This has been a marathon of a race. I continue to look forward to speaking with you tonight in the future. Uh, and please know that I plan to be your voice in the Senate. Thank you. Well, now it's appropriate to applaud and thank you. Five or six of you whose questions I didn't get to, but perhaps you can grab a candidate uh, in a few moments of our informal.